HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by Hearst Ranch, the nation's largest single-source supplier of free-range, all-natural, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef. For more information, visit HearstRanch.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit HeritageRadioNetwork.org for thousands more. All right. Once again, you've tuned in to the Heritage Radio Network. You're listening to The Farm Report. I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks. We are coming to you live from the back of Roberta's Pizza in beautiful Bushwick, Brooklyn. And every week on The Farm Report, we take a, a look into some new aspect of the world of food and agriculture. And today is no different. We are on the line with Eric Hoffner, who's the outreach coordinator at Orion. Eric, welcome to the show. Hi, Aaron. Well, it's wonderful to have you on, and I'm really excited to uh, share the amazing work you guys do at Orion with our listeners. But I thought before we kind of tuck into a little bit of the the history of the organization, we should give them just a broad sense of of who you are and and what you do. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Well, Orion is a 30-year-old publication that started out in New York City and is now based in western Massachusetts. We're a bi-monthly nonprofit magazine. And we like to think of ourselves as a forum for ideas and art that um, kind of helps shape how, how people are thinking about living on the planet. It's everything uh, that you care about from economy to politics through a, an ecological lens. And what we really, our stock and trade, I suppose, is uh, featuring writers with ideas that kind of plant the stakes further out from where we're thinking currently. Um, you know, there are many magazines and, and media outlets out there that give you great news, that give you super analysis, but we're, we really try to traffic in ideas that we feel like uh, push the thinking forward. Like, for example, and this is, this is a good example, actually, for the Farm Report, Michael Pollan wrote in our pages that uh, local is the new organic uh, before he wrote it anywhere else. It was just a one-page little thing, and uh, so that's the sort of thing that that we like to do, you know. So Wendell Berry, Terry Tempest Williams, Sandra Steingraber, uh, Bill McKibben, all these sort of folks uh, write for us regularly and contributing editors. So uh, it's sort of our privilege to be a forum for all these folks and to present their work in a in a beautiful format. Um, I don't know if you've seen the magazine, but it is it's ad-free and it's just uh, very, very beautiful, but also printed on the best uh, post-consumer recycled stock we can find. So it's a, it's a really nice package. Yeah, I, w- I would say it's it's gorgeous, and I would encourage all of my listeners to um, subscribe now because you guys are actually doing a, a subscription special. I think it's just uh, twenty twenty dollars for a six issue run, and um, you know I really love that idea. You know, planting the the stake out in the future and. Looking through the publications, that was uh, what I was really struck by. Was like, man, there's a lot of deep and serious thought held within these pages, and presented in a variety of formats. I mean, there's amazing poetry, beautiful photography, essays, you know, short stories, 
Um, you guys are really coming at these kind of issues of nature and, and culture and place from a variety of mediums uh, that I was just I was really struck by 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 the breadth of of the issues that are covered, but also the presentation is just so beautiful. It felt I, I want to say delicious, although I feel like that's kind of a funny <laughs> word to use about a magazine. Oh, I don't mind it. Yeah, it's a real privilege for me to work in the same office where the editors are putting all of this together and and curating the photographs and everything. I I live on the periphery of all that, and I get to see the magazine in in various states of design and uh, construction, but um, we're a pretty slim little unit. You know, we don't have any writers here. Uh, We just have editors and, and people like me that work to get their work out into the world. Um, all the writers that write for us are, are freelancers. They're independent people who just pitch us great ideas, and, and the top ones, you know, for every issue we print. And so it's really fun for me to see how that evolves and, and what the decision-making process is and, and how it just comes together into this uh, beautiful thing that stares at you off the newsstand. Uh, well, I will say I first came to Orion actually through your classified ads when I was Working up at Flying Pigs Farm, and we were looking to bring on a new farm manager. We we posted through the Orion Classifieds, and definitely that was the place where we got the most kind of qualified, um, both in terms of experience, but also in terms of kind of intention and expectation uh, candidates. And you guys are, you know, have been a publication for many years, but you're kind of branching out into some other types of uh, outreach. You're doing podcasts now, and can you tell us a little bit about the other ways people can engage with the work you're doing? Sure, yeah, of course we've got the social media channels dialed in, like Twitter and Facebook. We also do live uh, web events once a month where I will host a writer from the current issue or one of our contributing editors who's doing a really interesting new project for an hour-long conversation, and uh, he or she will tell us about what they're doing, and and listeners can see their work displayed on the screen and, uh, you know, chime in with their thoughts and comments. It's just a a really nice way to connect with our entire audience and give them a chance to, you know, speak directly to Wendell Berry, you know, once in a while. It's kind of a thrill for me, but I hope it is for our listeners, too. And we do, you know... Lots of uh, in-person events as well. We host green drinks here in in our neighborhood once a month. We go to film festivals where we're uh, media sponsors, and like we were in Northern California two weeks ago with uh, the Wild and Scenic Festival, where we helped develop programming and brought some authors in, and you know, emceed some film events. It was really uh, very fun, and, and Nevada City is a wonderful place if you ever get out that way. Yeah. Um, Um, But, yeah, about the job board, before I forget, yeah, if anyone's interested in looking for farm-related work, it's uh, very easy to find by going to orionmagazine.org slash jobs. And that thing is just getting packed as it starts with every January between now and April. It's just going to be full of great ideas for internships, apprenticeships, you know, and a wide variety of uh, kind of uh, green sort of avenues, but... uh, Sustainable ag is a really uh, big uh, cornerstone for us. And I think, Aaron, why you've probably got great applicants for your farm jobs is because, you know, these are the same people who are reading Wendell Berry in their their classes, you know, in college, and, and they're inspired by the whole theory. And so, you know, we, we connect them with good work afterwards, and it and, uh, turns out really well. So, Well, one of the things I want to talk about with you today is is kind of the role of of media in in shaping uh, our food supply and shaping our agricultural landscape. What are the opportunities with regards to um, education and activism? And you know, I was taking a look through the organization's mission and history, and and thought there was such a lovely quote um, from from George Russell, who was the publication's first editor in chief back in eighty two. Who he you know they in in the write up they he boldly he boldly stated Orion's values and, and I'm just going to quote here from from the website. It is Orion's fundamental conviction that humans are morally responsible for the world in which we live, and that the individual comes to sense this responsibility as he or she develops a personal bond with nature. And you know it's interesting that that was kind of the 
the idea on the outset when you guys were housed in the middle of, of, of New York City. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about in, in, in those first years, kind of how the publication got going and um, some of the transition that has led to your current uh, location. Oh, sure. We started out as a, a book review, uh, just looking at interesting, you know, new uh, entries into the eco-literature world. And then we found that we wanted to write more than just about books, so it became the Orion Nature Quarterly yeah, and we were based in um, some part of Manhattan that I'm not familiar with. Uh, but uh, at that point, it really started to kind of take off. We, you know, we got Barry Lopez and other people like that really interested in our work, and, um, you know, Jane Goodall, people like that. But um, at some point, we we realized that there was this burgeoning thing going on in the world with um, a, a new literature that was coming around called, you know, nature writing. And so we were really tracking that and the whole grassroots uh, response to what we saw in the late 70s and early 80s, the rollbacks of so many environmental laws. You know, in the 70s, we thought, oh, we got the Clean Water Act, we got the Clean Air Act, we got the Clean Everything Act, and now the government's got it all figured out and we're going to have a great environment, yada, yada. Well, in the early 80s, it became clear that industry was rolling back a lot of those those gains and, and that grassroots groups were popping up everywhere across the map. And that was really interesting. And the work they were doing was, was so great and so localized, And whether it was local food system networks or, or watershed restoration. We wanted to cover that. So uh, the sense was, let's get out into the areas ourselves where this is happening, you know, get out of the city and and live in rural Western Mass, where um, our publisher has a house, so we sort of just aggregated around that and found a great home in Great Barrington, Mass. Um, you know, what's funny is since that whole diaspora of Orion left New York, it's become really interesting and 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 very um, timely to to turn the eyes back to the city because so many good things are happening. In places like New York, with with the um, you know the urban ag scene, with um, the the way art, public art, is being done, that that really brings in so many uh, pieces of of the, the landscape. So uh, you know there are parts we find ourselves going into cities quite a bit now, you know, to to see what's going on there. So I guess you can't be everywhere, but. Uh, we like where we are now. <laughs> you can try. And now, what is the difference between Orion and the Orion Society? Well, the Orion Society is like our fiscal agent. That's the um, what we fundraise under, you know, and and it and it its mission is to make Orion Magazine go. Um, you know, if you look at other publications like The Nation or Mother Jones, they have the same sort of scenario as nonprofits. They have a some sort of institute, which you might not even recognize its name, but it, it that's what powers the organization. So, yeah, the Orion Society raises uh, like 70% of our annual budget just from subscriptions and from you know, small donations from, from people like you and me. So it's, uh, it's really um, kind of a grassroots effort, really, to get these ideas out into the world. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that I'm often uh, really looking for is is different um, media resources, different ways to kind of learn about what's happening in different parts of the country and, and where the kind of next, uh, I don't know, not next generation per se, but next kind of group of thoughts that are going to trickle into the kind of more common conversation around our, our natural world. And so what I would love to do now is just to give, get a chance to give our readers a, or our listeners, your readers, <laughs> a, a little taste of uh, the type of coverage that you guys provide in the magazine. Um, I'm, I'm looking here at the January, February 2013 edition. And I know that we, we recently actually hosted on um, Straight No Chaser, Heller Heather Miller, um, who did a, a little report, uh, or, or, or an article on nanoparticles um, titled um, Pandora's Box. And um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, because um, I know you guys did host, did, you did host a podcast with her. Is that right? 
Yes, we hosted a live conversation with her and with the researcher from Duke whose project she she visits. Uh, he's one of the few research team leaders out there that's looking at nanotechnology from the impact side, not just from the application side. You know, all the R&D and money in the world for research is going into uh, what can we build with nanotechnology and who can we sell it to and get in all these products as soon as possible. Well, um, so she, Heather, went and, and, and interviewed this fellow um, from Duke, and it's part of a multi-university um, collaborative to study how nanoparticles, these little, you know, and you've heard of nano silver and nano titanium dioxide, probably, things like that, that are regularly added to things like socks, to kill germs, to our food, to make them white, to toothpaste, to shampoo. They have all these 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 properties that help consumer products look or work better, but we don't have any concept of how they are moving through the environment. So um, Heather talked to this fellow and uh, t- you know saw the uh, little, little mini ecosystems they're building at the on the campus of Duke and introducing these nanoparticles and tracing how they move and and how some of them you know sometimes you know you can you can eat nano titanium dioxide and it's it's fine for you to do that, but once it enters the environment and has access to these other things, we find that they get toxic. Um, so that's what they're discovering there. So you know, it's it's a it's an, a kind of a stock and trade article for Orion, where we we take something that's becoming to be an accepted notion and try to explode it and see what's hiding around the corners. And she did a great job with that. So yeah, I had Heather, and we had the. The researcher from Duke, and I also invited uh, an ethicist from Northeastern and a consumer advocate from the Center for Food Safety, and the five of us batted around these questions and took questions from an audience as well that were listening, and it was it turned out to be really interesting and uh, pretty well-balanced and pretty uh, wide-ranging. So you can actually listen to that if you go to orionmagazine.org slash discuss. There's um, all the audio of all of our live web events are listed there. Nice. And then also check out Heather's interview with uh, host Katie Kiefer on Straight No Chaser. One of the, you know, one that was of a great the, one. I mean, it, it, was, it was kind of fascinating. And Katie is always like, she so has her kind of finger on the pulse of the next thing that, um, you know, we need to be thinking about. And, and one of the things I find often challenging is kind of balancing the information with the kind of paranoia, like what level of, you know, risk and importance should these things be playing in our lives and it's like often um, uh, I find it's often helpful to set it in a little bit of historical context which I thought Heather did really nicely in this article I mean she talks about you know as a society that we we've, we've been here before I'm quoting paraphrasing she's like releasing a miracle technology before its potential health and environmental ramifications are understood let alone investigated and then she goes on to list um, she's like remember how DDT was going to stamp out malaria and typhus and revolu- revolutionize agriculture how asbestos was going to make buildings fireplace how you know how BPAs would make plastics clear and nearly shatterproof and you know she goes on you know GMOs PCBs and and then now now nanotech and I think uh, the the article really demonstrates the the importance of having a really um, grounded perspective when you come to an issue, which is I think something the publication does so nicely. It's like balancing uh, the information in a current and historical sense, but also not feeling like you need to answer all the questions. I think one of the things that struck me going through wow. these most recent issues is I walk away almost with more questions to to ask than per se questions that have been answered and it really just feels like a like a thinking person's um huh. magazine which That's is great lovely. feedback yeah we'd li- we like to be less prescriptive than than you'll typically see in magazines yeah it's definitely about asking the right questions well, we are going to move. We, we need to take just a short break. And when we come back, I'd like to just tuck into a couple of more samples from this recent edition to kind of show the breadth of coverage and, and continue this conversation on the role of uh, media in shaping our world. Great. You're listening to Snickers by Obesity on the Heritage Radio Network dot O-R-G.
first ranch grass-fed beef. Pasture raised on 150,000 acres in Central California. Hearst Ranch grass-fed beef, free-range, sustainably produced, humane. Hearst Ranch grass-fed beef, the authentic flavor of the American West. We all know what a foodie is, but what's foodiness? Foodiness is turning us into those chubby, slushy, slurping, lounge chair-bound morons in Wally, plugged in, pumped full of sugar, and brain dead. Chef Erica Wides is here to fight against foodiness. You have to keep drinking the Let's Get Real Kool-Aid for it to start to work. Let's Get Real. Rediscover real food every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. on heritageradionetwork.org. All right, we are back. You have tuned into the Heritage Radio Network. You're listening to The Farm Report. I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks, and we're on the line with Eric Hoffner from Orion. And we are, are talking about the uh, history of the publication and, and going through some of the, the articles from this most recent edition. And I, I have to say, I was kind of struck by um, the, the Dark Ecology, a piece by uh, Paul Kingsnorth. And you know, I, I was flipping through the magazine and this, this little section jumped out. He says, I've recently begun reading the collections of Theodore Kaczynski. I'm worried that it might change my life. Uh, so, <laughs> and I was like, what? Like Ted Kaczynski? Like, mm-hmm. And, you know, he goes on to kind of have this, um, you know, conversation about, you know, the value of technology and the role of technology and, um, you know, modernized poverty and, uh, again, I'm like I'm curious if if you could talk a little bit about how how this type of piece is representative of of things that you choose to include in the magazine, and maybe share some of your reflections. Sure. Well, that that piece is a tough one to characterize, but Paul is a is, lives in northern UK, and was one of the founding guys behind the Ecologist, who which is the UK's top environmental magazine, and you know, a campaigner with a long background, uh, you know, studied in college in Borneo and, you know, so really just was on the sort of cutting first edge of, of the new environmental movement. And at this point, he's, uh, he's, he's decided he's pulling back. He doesn't, he doesn't recognize the environmental movement that he uh, came of age into and uh, decries um, things like industrial... Um, renewable energy, um, the sense that, you know, caring for the planet is about dealing with carbon. Um, you know, so he calls that whole sort of, uh, new, you know, green is the new black sort of um, thing that you'll see everywhere, you know, what's environmental this, what's environmental that, you know, he, he thinks it's, all, it's too much marketing and it's, it's gotten the, the whole movement away from its roots, which is about you know, taking care of people and planet, you know, first and foremost. So he calls that whole thing neo-environmentalism. And he just, he's, you know, he says, you know, I'm withdrawing from all that. I'm still going to do, you know, work for local conservation and things like that. But, you know, I, I'm through with, with these sort of uh, prescriptions that I, I, I don't, that don't agree with, um, you know, the my basic tenets for environmentalism. So it's an interesting piece. It's been very provocative and, um, you know, we get lots of appreciative letters. We get lots of questioning letters, um, you know, but everyone is challenged by it. So that's that's what kind of tells us, you know, when, when an article like that pushes the dial a little bit, you know, even if it's uncomfortable, uh, we feel like that's a success. Because even when you can read something like this, and, and that article is, is on the, our homepage, orionmagazine.org, if you want to dip in there and see what you think. But, you know, when when it, when that kind of when it, people are surprised, and even if they can refute what what an art, author is saying, they will have reexamined their beliefs. You know, and I think that is also uh, very valuable. Um, the the next piece I want to take a quick look at is uh, Sandra Steingraber, um, and she she talks about the silence of science. And, and again, I think I'm I'm just kind of was continually struck by the the amazing quality uh, of the writing and the unexpected uh, language. And I'm just going to quote another uh, short piece from, from her article. Uh, she says, the, 
The lesson I took from all this was that trails of corruption invariably lead to the Justice Department and that the cover-up likely involves school board members and deacons and Jesus is no deep throat. There were two places to go from here, nihilism or biology, and I chose biology. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it's like the sense of kind of like humor is, is so I don't, for whatever reason, it's like so unexpected to me. Um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on this piece in particular, but um, it's basically... She, she's talking about uh, this, uh, you know, pastor who essentially chained himself to a fence to prevent uh, uh, a, a, you know, a fracking drilling from going on and essentially the community's response and a little bit of a reflection of the role of, you know, biology versus religion and um, a really kind of neatly handled um, piece. Yeah. Well, Sandra's such a treasure. She, as you can tell from this piece, she's just writes so lyrically, and it's because she's got uh, a master's in, in poetry. But before she got her master's in poetry, she got a PhD in, in in biology. She's a you know one of the nation's lead cancer um, uh, writers and and thinkers. Um, after having had cancer in herself in college. And uh, so she blends these two worlds of data and of lyricism so well. But, you know, she lives in upstate New York where fracking really wants to move in, and she is one of the leading voices nationwide, not only in New York, to question that whole principle, that this is something positive and it's something we need. Her her standpoint is uh, the, the health of our groundwater for the next thousand or ten thousand years is way more important than ten years of, of fuel uh, and uh, she's been laying out her argument in her columns in Orion she's in every other issue of Orion and she's been laying out her argument and through her columns and they are persuasive I really <laughs> suggest people picking up anything Sandra Steingraber has written uh, you can search our website to see what we've posted of hers as well but she's she's top-notch and you know, she goes everywhere with it. She talks about how fracking kills micro <laughs> biota in the a thousand feet down that we don't even know about. There's a huge ecosystem down there, and we're just, you know, we're, we're free to poison that. And she wonders about that, but she also wonders about agriculture. You know, how are we supposed to feed ourselves? We have this amazing, vibrant local food uh, movement starting, but, you know, whole regions of this country aren't going to be able to use their own groundwater for, for air, irrigating crops, that doesn't sound like uh, the domestic security we were offered with, you know, cheap gas. So she's, yeah, I, I'm glad you picked that out because she's one of my favorites. She's also just a stand-up person that uh, maybe you should interview sometime. Yeah. Yes, I, w I would love to. So please make an introduction for us. Um, oh, sure. Well, so this has been kind of a, a different show than I, I usually do on my program, and it, it I wanted to bring you on because, uh, you know, I think we are uh, so often kind of just in search of of guidance, um, but also there's like a real need, especially I feel like in New York City, to be able to take a step back and and do some kind of quiet, deep thinking. And I think your you know the publication really allows for that. And I'm I'm curious, you know, you guys have been around for about thirty plus years, right? Yeah, this is our thirty first year starting. So, I mean, how? <laughs> How did how did you do it? Like, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, you're not, um, you know, you're not. It's a niche audience, and 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 I'm curious, like, the uh -huh. the the engagement. Like, what is it about Orion? I mean, I guess we. I feel like we've kind of illuminated some of that, but I don't know if you have any other kind of things you would like to share as to you know why why you've been able to to have success over the past 30 years when so many kind of similarly like lovely publications have have fallen by the wayside sure well different model uh but you know the fact is that we have subscribers and an astounding number of our subscribers re up every year it's an industry uh people in the industry are jealous of the rate of our resubscriptions cuz people just love it so you know and they demand us keep printing you know don't we love that you have a digital edition we love that it's available on kindle we love that you do podcasts and you're into all this new media to different degrees but don't ever stop printing this magazine so we have 
a niche audience of people who just really appreciate that you can pick this thing up and feel it in your fingers, and when the lights go out or you're on the train, you know, and your battery's low, you can still read it, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I kind of envision, uh, you know, folks walking around with, I, I mean, myself anyway, with the tattered copy in my book and then kind of wanting to share it, you know, kind of passing, passing it on to the next person when, when you've read through. So um, I would sure. definitely recommend folks uh, take advantage of your current subscription special. Like I said, it's just $20 for uh, a yeah, full year. Yeah, it's a free trial deal. If you go to the, our website, orionmagazine.org, there's a button in the top right corner. It says free trial issue. And you can just try it for free. And, and if you like that first issue, then you can pay 19 bucks to get the other five. And if it isn't your ball of wax, then you can keep that one and there's there's no harm done. Yeah. Um, I think, too, also as people are looking for resources and guidance when they try and think about what is their role in engaging in the future of our food supply, in the future of our agricultural economies, that you you guys kind of – essentially your, your writers are – become like the, the cliff notes, like the, the who's who of, of the natural world writing and, and a, I don't know, a cheat sheet for people who are looking for uh, guidance uh, as they develop their own kind of path, I guess, in the, in, the, in the industry. So, Eric, I wanted to thank you so much for sharing some time with us today, and I, I look forward to kind of keeping in touch and definitely um, hosting some of Orion's contributors here on the Farm Report and other programs on the network. And thank you for Heritage Radio. It's a wonderful resource and uh, great for everyone in New York and everyone else as well who gets it by the podcast. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So thanks for doing what you do. All right. We'll be in touch. So all right. this, like all 27 of our live weekly shows, is available for free uh, as a download through iTunes. You can find us on Stitcher Smart Radio. And all of our programming is archived on the website, www.heritageradionetwork.org. We are a member-supported organization, so if you like what you hear and want to support us, please make a donation by clicking the Donate button on the website. And tune in next week for another episode of The Farm Report. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes Store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. What's hot at the green market? You're about to find out now. It's the Grow NYC Market Update. All right. Once again, it's time for the Grow NYC Market Update. We're making our way through the 12 weeks of winter, although I'll be honest, doesn't feel too wintry today. Um, we are on the line with Jean from uh, Grow NYC Green Markets. Jean, uh, you're working from home today, I heard? I am working from home, battling off a little bit of a winter sickness, even if it's not so cold outside. Oh, man. Well, well rest up. Thanks for making some time to chat. Well, we're... We're ready to tuck right in. Like, what's uh, what what's the what's the story of the week from the from the green markets? Sure. Well, I was um, out at the market on Saturday, and one of the things that I eat year round, but especially appreciate getting at the market in the winter, is yogurt. And my go-to is Ronnie Brook Farm Dairy. Um, so I've always wondered. Well, first of all. There's there's something special about Ronnie Brook in the winter, and that's that they're known for their beautiful bottles of glass milk. And you might not see those glass bottles out uh, at their stand in in the winter, and that's because they have to be kept inside the truck so that they don't crack in the cold weather. But rest assured, the milk is there. Just ask the the person running the farm stand for it, and they'll hop up in the truck and find the bottles for you. Um, but I was talking this morning to Ronnie Osofsky, the farmer, at the dairy farm, and he said that if it gets to about 32 degrees outside, that's when they start to worry about the bottles. 
And the big trick is once they're taking all those empty bottles back to the farm to make sure that they're not too cold and, like, break more easily in the back of the truck. So they're, they're doing a big balancing act for our benefit down here in the city, and uh, I definitely appreciate it. But the, the product I really wanted to ask him about was yogurt because I've always noticed in the winter that their yogurt, it's sort of cream-lined, full-fat is the kind that I get. But... Um, it always seems to be that much creamier in the winter, and I was wondering why that was. And he said it's because in the winter the cows go into the barn and that their butter, uh, their butter fat is higher when they're sitting in the barn. So that makes perfect sense. It also makes it kind of a special product to eat in the middle of the winter when you're kind of wondering what else might be seasonal at the market. But the interesting thing he said was that there's no heating in the barn. So the farm, the, the cows are actually the furnace. They're actually making their own house warm, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, and they kind of, they actually like the cooler weather. They go outside still every day unless it's icy, at which point he would worry about them kind of, he doesn't want them to, you know, slip on the ice or hurt themselves. And he said there's usually about one day a year when it's so cold that the cows don't go out at all. But that for the most part, they go out. He sends them out in batches so that the barn doesn't get too cold. So they go out and kind of take turns, and then they come back in and heat it up for each other. And he said that they really kind of regulate their schedule. Like when they're done outside, they, they come back in. They let them know when it's time. Um, so they obviously, this farm has a very personal connection with their cows. They have Holsteins, and um, it just sounds like a very nice relationship. So they're inside eating hay this time of year. And, um, and producing really delicious yogurt for us. And another thing I was thinking about in terms of seasonality with Ronnie Burke's products, I was thinking about, you know, as the season turns towards spring, how, how you might notice that in the products. And, of course, I always look at it in the butter. The butter, as you get into spring and summer, turns more of that kind of beautiful yellow color that we look for. So they make uh, a European-style butter, which has 86 to 88 percent butter fat, which is really high. American butter has about 80% butter fat. And even if you look in stores for like Plugra or uh, Kerrygold, sort of fancier imported brands of European style butter, they don't even have 88% butter fat. This is like literally the cream of the crop. This is really <laughs> good stuff. Um, and so uh, it's just, you know, the butter fat is, is um, high this time of year anyways. But um, I would eat that butter like cheese on toast. I think it's amazing. I can't speak highly enough for it. So as, as the weather warms up and the cows start to graze on fresh grass, uh, again, you'll start to see um, they're, they have sort of higher vitamin D. And so that keratin is what's showing up and causing the color to turn in the butter. No, that's so interesting. And I think kind of one of the other things you touched on that um, is, is the fact that the, the milk or the yogurt are cream line. Um, which, which I think essentially just means that the milk hasn't been homogenized so that mm -hmm. the butterfat content that you're getting is whatever is coming out of the cow, which is different from most milk production where essentially the, there's like a legal um, level of butterfat you need to include in something to be called whole mm -hmm. milk or 2% or milk, obviously. So oftentimes I'll find cream line milk tastes creamier because it has more butter fat in it because none of that butter fat has been taken out and to put into another use, whether heavy cream or, or butter. And so it's one of those interesting ways I think that you really noted to kind of track, track the seasons and also kind of understand, um, you know, where along the production lines, uh, different producers are making different decisions. Um, where, where is Ronnie Brook located? So they are upstate in Columbia County in Akrondale, New York. Um, and Ronnie, who I talked to this morning, he's a third-generation farmer. So his grandfather was a farmer. His father actually started on the land that he's on now. And then Ronnie has um, many generations following him. So even his youngest grandkids are taking animals to the county fair and showing them. So everybody's involved. Um, and he was telling me that they milk around 100 cows. They're the offspring of a, a long line of prize-winning Holsteins, and then they also have a couple of Jersey cows, and you're saying they might even get a brown Swiss this year. Nice, mixing it up. Um, yeah. Well, well, obviously, you know, I'm always a fan of drinking milk out of the carton and mm -hmm. eating yogurt out of the carton, but <laughs> what, what are maybe some other ways we can uh, mix up our usage of the Ronnie, Ronnie Brook product line? Sure. Well, I remember talking to a chef years ago who was talking about how much he loves to work with Ronnie Brook because it has that nice thick fat cap at the top of the milk bottle. I'd never heard 
the, the cream line called that before, but there was something very appealing about the fat cap, I thought. So it's great for cocoa. It's great for making ice cream if you want to make ice cream this time of year. I was thinking about making pudding. I really love pudding in the winter. So I made a big batch of rice pudding the other day and used some whole milk from Ronnie Brook. Um, I've been putting yogurt on my oatmeal. You can use it, um, you know, milk and butter when you're making macaroni and cheese. So it's um, it's a pretty good staple this time of year. And then also I was thinking it was kind of fitting for the radio show this week because, of course, the Super Bowl is coming up on Sunday. And uh, Ronnie Brooks yogurt or creme fraiche, if, if their stand has it, terrific stand-ins for sour cream if you're going to be making dips for Super Bowl parties. Nice, nice. Now, all right, speaking of, uh, you know, changes in the air, signs of spring. I think we have a there's mm-hmm. like a little holiday coming up, right? Oh yeah. We've got Groundhog's Day on Saturday, not to be forgotten. <laughs> I asked Ronnie about that. I said, What's the first sign of spring on the farm? He said, It's not Groundhog's Day. Don't worry. He said it's not until the spring onions and the wildflowers start coming up. But definitely we want to pay attention to what happens with that groundhog on Saturday to see whether or not we're gonna have six more weeks of winter, um, whether or not he sees a shadow. Um, we've been running our winter warrior programs at market, so people are continuing to check in and getting points kind of as frequent shoppers every time they check in at the market. Um, and then also in terms of cooking demonstrations, we've got the Super Bowl on our mind at Green Market this weekend. So um, a number of markets are doing, I think, chili um, chili cooked with turkey, Super Bowl foods, how to make your own dip at home. So look for those cooking demonstrations, I think, especially at Grand Army, Cortellu, and the Carroll Gardens markets. There will be chili samples on hand. There will be recipes for people to try. Nice. A good way to be the most popular attendee of any Super Bowl party, I'm sure. Well, Jean, Absolutely. thanks so much for sharing the update. Uh, if, as always, if folks want to find out more about what's happening at the at the markets or through Growing NYC, volunteer opportunities, recipes, farmer profiles, market schedules, they can visit you at www.grownyc.org. Um, follow you on Twitter, Facebook, and uh, tune in next week for another episode of the Grow NYC Market Update. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.